become terrorism, the more uh, the more anxious the government is, right? That terrorism is just a governmental name for a certain intensity of political struggle. There is no there is no internal intrinsic definition of terrorism. It only has a structural definition in relation to the state. And as states are less able to purchase social peace, right, via via various kinds of um, the social wage, right, the various kinds of programs and health care and unemployment benefits, the less states can purchase social peace, the more they have to compel social social peace with force, right? They move from hegemony to coercion in the classic distinction. Uh, and the more that they're compelled to maintain social peace by coercion, by sticks rather than carrots, the more they're going to start to name things as terrorism uh, because it has, because social struggle has to be taken as a, as a political uh, police matter rather than as a, a social question that can be resolved via a wealth transfer, right? So um, I think that, that terrorism is just a pure name that has a lot to do with the state's given mode of maintaining social order. Um, the question of whether riot, when riot or strike moves to revolution, that I absolutely have to bracket. Um, always, never, sometimes, we'll talk about it next week. This is def definitely um, exactly, I think, such an important and big question that I want to hold off on that and not not leap into it. Is it okay with folks if I move into the Arigi framework now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. I appreciate your, your, your sticking with me. Now, it may be that a couple of you have encountered Arigi, Giovanni Arigi before. I'm going to try to summarize what is a 900 page argument in about eight minutes. That's a, a ludicrous thing to do. And so uh, you'll be aware surely that I'm giving you quite an incomplete and schematic picture. Fortunately, he's a quite schematic thinker in ways I find useful. Uh, and he comes from the tradition of world systems analysis, which is sort of the super big picture modeling of the history of world capitalism. Uh, it starts with the Annal School of History in France, notably the figure Fernand Braudel, the most notable practitioner of world systems analysis. I'm going to sort of throw out names in case people want uh, um, like to hear names of thinkers they like or want to hear names that they haven't encountered yet and want to I, go, go look into them. So it comes from Fernand Braudel. Uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein is the leading practitioner of world systems analysis. Giovanni Arrighi is maybe a bit of a heretic, or was, he died uh, five years ago, um, who eventually sort of renounced it, although not bitterly, I don't think. He just identified his own practice as somewhat different from the mode of Wallerstein and the leading practitioners of world systems analysis. But really, he starts as an economist. He's trained in Italy. He does his studies in West Africa on, on developing West African economies. He ends up teaching in a sociology program at Johns Hopkins, which is sort of the strange fate. If you're a heterodox economist, you can hardly be hired in an economics department and you end up in, uh, in these other places. So he ends up in the, in the sociology department. And the story he tells is, again, a, a usefully schematic one. He basically says, <clears throat> first of all, he does, he does a thing which many uh, orthodox Marxists would disagree with, which is that he says, I'm not really that interested in some metaphysical argument about whether capitalism really, really starts. I just want to know this thing. There have been four major, he doesn't call them empires. I'm going to use the word empire, which he might object to, but he's not around. Uh, there have been four major empires uh, going back in the last six centuries or so that have been historically distinct. They've been similar to each other, but different from all other empires, um, and that they provide a paradigm for understanding the structuration of the globe. So he makes this very nice distinction to start with, which is, you know, Marx has this, for, this the formula for the expanded formula for capital, which is MCM prime. So first there's an MC period, money to commodities, and then there's a CM period, commodities to money, but but more money. And Marx, Marx says that's the logic of capital, which he opposes to the logic of sort of 
non-capitalist economics, which is not MCM, but CMC, starting with commodities, turning it into money to get more commodities. And Arigi does this neat magic trick where he says, I'm going to make that a, a, a spatial logic. He says there's two kinds of empires. One is TMT. So you start with territory and you make money so as to take more territory. And your goal is to uh, gather in as much territory as possible, ideally the whole globe. So you can think of like Napoleon or Alexander the Great or any number of empires, right, where the goal is just to dominate all territory, eventually the entire globe. They always fail eventually. But so those are that's a territorial logic, which he says TMT. And then he says at some point in history, you get this new kind of empire, which is uh, MTM. It takes territory only if it will make more money by taking that territory. So it's an economically centered empire and it won't expand physically unless there's a there's a, 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 a sensible econ, reason, uh, reason to believe that will allow for economic expansion. And if there, it won't allow for economic expansion, it will not expand. So he identifies these as the sort of new kind of imperial structure, uh, MTM, uh, which he identifies with capitalism, right? The capitalist empire is MTM, whereas the non-capitalist empire is TMT. Uh, and he says there have been four of these MTM empires in history, which he identifies with the Italian city-states. And the chart I have in front of you, that's the Genoese, uh, who are the bankers of the Italian city-states. Then the Dutch empire, uh, the, the United, United Provinces, then the British Empire and the U.S. Empire uh, in which we currently reside. Uh, I don't actually have no idea if everyone currently resides in the U.S. who's in this chat room, but I, I apparently reside in the U.S. Um, so for Orthodox Marxists, right, only the latter two are part of capitalism proper, the British Empire, which takes off with the Industrial Revolution, and the U.S. Empire, uh, and that's actually not a necessary fight here, just to put the Aurigian framework in place. Because what he notes is about these empires, that each empire itself follows the same internal pattern before coming to an end. Now I have to find another slide. Yeah. Sorry that has that weird... Uh, blue bar there. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure why that's the case, but I don't think it will ruin our, our enjoyment too much. So here is his chart of the last 600 years, more than 600 years, in which he lists the four empires. Now I know this chart is a little busy, so I'm going to try to, can you all see my, like the red pointer thing that's working? I want to click in a yes if they can see the red. Yeah, okay, cool. This feels so technological to me. Uh, so we have these four empires. Here's the what he identifies as the Italian city-states or the Genoese one right here. Then here's the United Province one. Then here's the British one. And then here is the U.S. one up here. He identifies each of these as a so-called long century. Each one of these lasts something around 100 years, although... As you'll notice immediately, they're getting shorter and shorter. Now, not only are they getting shorter and shorter, but they overlap. And this is, this is important to his structure, right? So we have the first empire here, and that, that's where it ends for him. But the second empire has already begun. This is the United Provinces, which goes all the way to here, more or less. Overlapping, here's the British Empire, which has already begun, which goes to here. And you'll notice that here's the US Empire. So they're overlapping empires. As any one empire declines, the next empire rises. Now, they're not empires in the sense of just being successful. The reason this would fall in the category of world systems analysis is they manage to organize the world around them. That is to say, it's in the interest of all the other nations within the economic system to go along with the sort of the big dog nation. That's his definition of hegemony, right? So that, uh, as long as the, the, the British Empire, let's say, is producing massive profits at a global scale, it's worth it for all these other nations to agree to go along with British power because they're taking some of that surplus as well, sort of working for everyone. 
but at some point it stops working for everyone, right? The, the, the empire's ability to generate accumulation, uh, that's why they're called systemic cycles of accumulation. So to generate accumulation at a global scale declines, uh, it's no longer worth it for all those nations to go along with that nation. There starts to be struggles for power, periods of what he calls turbulence or volatility, in which a new hegemon uh, starts to arise. And they start to arise in a quite interesting way. And here's where we get to the important specifics. Uh, for Arigi, based on quite elaborate historical research, this is not sort of just a theory, right? There's very heavy empirical research here. Um, these, the expansion of these nations is an industrial expansion, uh, more or less, and it, it, it's in which profit rates are very high. They're producing a lot of commodities, uh, but the profit rate declines uh, over the course of time. And everyone has their own theory of declining profit rate. Alex Smith has a theory. Ricardo has a theory. Marx has a theory. It doesn't matter so much. Arigi's point is not so much here's why they decline, but that they do. You get this decline in industrial profits, and uh, then you get, you get correspondingly the rise of a financial period. So this last, in each, each period, is divided sort of into thirds, as you can see. Um, this last period from here to here for Italy, or here to here for the United Kingdom is a period in which finance leads the nation. There's no other way for the nation to make money. It's not making money industrially. It's not making money in the mercantile manner. It's making money through finance. It needs to keep making money to stay the hegemon, the big, the big dog. So it, it pours all effort into generating profit in finance. But as we know all too well, that can only last for a certain period of time. Finance is always a bubble. Eventually, the bubble blows. But while that nation is generating a lot of uh, money through finance, uh, it has to lend it somewhere. It's not going to lend it to itself because its industrial profitability is very low. So it goes looking around the globe for other nations where it can lend the money. And it finds a nation which is capable of industrial expansion. It lends it a lot of money in an attempt to turn a profit financially. But of course, that ends up funding the next hegemon's rise. So this exactly happens in the US. The US has a lot of industrial capacity in the late 19th century. All the mobile capital from Great Britain pours into the US uh, in search of profit. The US builds up its industrial capacity and takes off and sure enough supplants the United Kingdom as the, as the global power. So we have a series of cycles. We have empire, 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 but within each empire, we have uh, essentially three parts. It starts with a merchant phase in which there's largely mercantile circulation, industrial expansion, and then industrial decline and financial expansion, and then the end of the nation. Uh, the end, end of the nation's role as the, as the leading nation in the world system. So merchant, industrial, industrial finance as the three phases of, uh, of an, em an empire's reign, rise and fall. Uh, Arigi notes that the beginning of the fall, the shift from industry to finance, always has a, involves a, uh, a major crisis, which he refers to as a signal crisis, indicating things have gone wrong. And then you have the financial period, and then it ends in what he calls a terminal crisis, from which the nation cannot recover and gives up its place as the leader of the world system. That is the Arigian structure. Uh, that is 900, 900 pages reduced pretty quickly. Now, I should note that uh, Arigi was given some pretty aggressive critiques. One of the main ones was from Hart and Negri. Uh, and uh, their, their, their critique goes, well, this is sort of just an eternal return, right? You're just saying this cycle plays out over and over again. Where does that have space for real transformation, for difference, for restructurations, aside from just this baton passing? And Arigi has quite an interesting answer for this. Well, his answer is, as is often the case, uh, well, Mr. Mr. Negri, Mr. Hart, you should have read my book more carefully. Uh, uh, he notes that each uh, empire um, has a, is different from the previous one. First of all, it has to start on a larger basis. So the first Italian city-state starts on a very small basis of like of cities. By the time you get to the U.S., it's a, you know, a continental empire, quite huge. If we imagine the next empire might be China, an even larger base. So 
you need progressively larger bases, and these, 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 these cycles are getting shorter and shorter. And that should uh, suggest to us that, right, that there is, there is not an infinite eternal return here. Because if you need a larger and larger basis, eventually you're going to run out of space, right? You're going to run out of globe to start a, a new empire on. And uh, if they're getting shorter and shorter, eventually they're going to come get, get so short they, they don't exist anymore. So Arigi's not claiming this goes on forever. In fact, he's noting this is lurching toward a limit. At what point can you no longer restart again at a, at a bigger scale? Now, of course, that description of the U.S. empire will be very familiar to many of you. The fact that we're in a period of financialization uh, in which finance capital dominates the U.S. That's largely where profits come from. Industrial profit, as a general fact, is way down. And indeed, the, in, the industrial profit rate in the United States collapses in 1973, which is one of the reasons I'm so interested in, in, in that date. And so that's, that's this right here, right, where the red dot is. That's the, what, what Rigi would refer to as the signal crisis in the United States, the crisis of 73. All kinds of things happen in 73. You could probably make a better list than, than I could. Um, at a political level, it's the end of the Vietnam War. The Paris Accords are signed. It's the first oil shock. Global profit rates decline. It's the process of detaching finally from the Bretton Woods gold standard. It's really a great moment of transformation. 73 is overly specific, maybe 68 to 73. But that's the moment when the U.S. empire shifts from being industrial to post-industrial, right? All this language we have of the U.S. being post-industrial, post-Fordist, flexible economy, all these terms we have uh, refer to the same thing, which is the transformation of the U.S. economy from industrial-based to a finance-based, uh, precisely as uh, Arigi would, would suggest. Uh, okay. So that's the Aregean framework, and now I want to add one more detail to it, uh, which I'm not sure I can go into as much depth as I might like, but I'm hoping uh, it will be adequate, which is this. So in political economy, there's a distinction made between, and again, some of this will, will some of you will, will know this quite well because you've encountered it before, some of you perhaps less so. There's a distinction made between profit and accumulation. So, for example, if all of us in this uh, in in this course were an economy, if we were an economy and uh, we all had a hundred dollars and a hundred dollars worth of uh, commodities, right, and we started trading them, so let's say, for example, I have a I have a hundred dollars and a hundred dollars worth of nails, and Daniel has a hundred dollars and a hundred dollars worth of hammers. And Ingrid has $100 and $100 worth of wood. You with me with the example? Oh, sorry, not Ingrid, Sigrid. I, I apologize, Sigrid. Um, has $100 worth of wood. So let's suppose, let's suppose I buy half of Daniel's, I've already, he has hammers. I buy half of his hammers for $50. And then I sell those hammers to Sigrid for $60. So I've done a classic thing, right? I've bought cheap and sold dear. I've made a $10 profit. Um, uh, Sigrid, I think, has done poorly. She, you know, she, she, she now has, she's made a $10 loss. There's been some redistribution of commodities. There's been profit. But the total amount of stuff in the system hasn't changed at all, right? The amount of hammers, nails, and wood that we're going to need to make whatever it is we're going to make, canoes, coffins, who knows. Uh, but that hasn't changed. The total amount of commodities and the total amount of money no change. So there's been no accumulation. The system hasn't grown. So this is a demonstration, right, that you can have profit without accumulation. That's, so that's like a zero-sum game, right? Mercantilism is a zero-sum game. And finance is a zero-sum game. Finance doesn't generate new value in the system. Uh, and in the, in the classic political economic account, the only thing that generates new value, right, in the Marxian account is exploitation of labor. Uh, uh, that it's the, the process of labor exploitation allows accumulation, which is why those periods of industrial capital in these, for these various uh, empires is a period of expansion uh, because it's an industrial capital and the exploitation of labor, you get this increase, whereas the mercantile period, I want to make my hand gestures here, the mercantile period and the finance period 
uh, you get profit, no accumulation, so the system's not growing, uh, whereas in the industrial period, the system is growing. Phew. Uh, that's the Aurigian structure. Uh, so let's take maybe another pause uh, and see if people have any questions they want to ask uh, at this point, and then I'll leap into my final, uh, which will turn out to be relatively brief, actually, taking of all these orienting theoretical uh, apparatuses and combining them into a quick yeah. story, story yeah. about riot. Sorry, say again. Sorry, say again. Uh, I'm not hearing the audio. I'm not hearing the audio. Uh, what were the three? Uh, what were the three? Uh, uh, Daniel asked, "What were the three?" Uh, uh, yes, you mentioned. I'm suddenly, suddenly getting a huge audio echo. Audio echo. I'm going to try turning off my microphone and turning it on again. All right, I'm trying my audio again. Seems to be working fine. So. Uh, Daniel Z has asked a question. What were the three shifts you mentioned? Uh, I'm not sure what shifts you mean. There's, ah, uh, well, there's, so there's three periods of capital within each, uh, cycle of accumulation, right? So let's really look at the U.S. cycle up here. Uh, but we could go, you know, go back to any of these. The three periods are the, uh, the three periods are the mercantile, uh, where mer merchant capital is what leads the way, the industrial, uh, where the main, the, the leading uh, form of capital is industrial production, and then finance capital. And each of these periods can more or less be uh, subdivided into those three, merchant, industrial, and finance. Someone, I can't remember what theorist, very interestingly refers to finance capital as cybernetic mercantilism. Um, I'm not sure I understand the implications of that term, but it seems useful to me uh, in the sense that finance, like mercantilism, is zero sum, right? Some people make vast paper profits. Some people lose vast, like there's vast redistribution, but there's no new value being added into the system. Uh, so the, the linking of the, of the end period and the beginning period uh, is that they're both zero sum, whereas the middle period is the period of expansion. Okay, now Dave. David Allen has asked for giant proclamation. All right, I'm, I'm trying to again restore the non-echo. David said, have you spelled out what the implications are for the Aurelian model for riots, or is that yet to be teased out? And that indeed leads me into the next moment of the discussion. So what are the implications uh, for a theory of riots over the long durée from the 17th century to the present of this Aurigian cycle uh, and of this logic of surplus population. And that's exactly what I want to try and uh, set forth uh, next and in, in some sense in conclusion. So uh, I want to now try and look at this picture I'm looking at and see if I can find a better slide. That's BBB. So I'm going to see if perhaps CC is a good slide. Uh, yeah, that's, that's quite useful. So here is just the last two cycles, the cycles that are part of capitalism proper, the long 19th century and the long 20th century of the, of the U.S. So as you, you can see, here's the British cycle. So this, this line right here is indicating the end of the United Provinces, but we need not worry about them too much. Although I'm super fascinated in the, the, um, the period of, of, uh, of, of Dutch global dominance. I'm trying to educate myself more about it. It's, it's quite uh, fascinating. They invent the stock market, among other things. The first stock market in the world is in Amsterdam in 1604. Uh, but um, so here's the British period. Here's the overlapping US period. And that's the period of capitalism proper, right? So this, I'm not sure where this dot is exactly supposed to be. It looks like Origi has it maybe around 1750. Uh, where uh, the British merchant capital, the, 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 the British East Indies and West Indies trading companies start to succeed in taking over the Dutch trade routes, and that's the, the sort of a merchant period. 
Then you get the industrial takeoff starting about here, which is, as I noted before, very shortly around 1784, if you want to give a specific date, uh, the date of the development of the steam engine and the possibilities of, of uh, large scale industrial production that that allows for uh, the various technologies. So that's the takeoff uh, there. And that's really turns out to be the period we're looking at, right? This is the transition. And that was that, that annoying purple bar that was on the previous uh, slide I showed you, was right in this period here, which is exactly the period of transition from strike, uh, from riot to strike, the first transition. So we want to now ask the, the, in some sense, obvious question, why is the transition from uh, riot to strike the exact same thing as the transition from uh, merchant capital to industrial capital within the first major capitalist cycle? Um, and that would seem to be the, where we want to go with David's question about the implications of the Aurelian model. Why is it exactly that the historical transformation uh, that, that we see in which the riot is the leading form of struggle to the strike is leading form of struggle. And I've already intimated the basic answer as well, industrial takeoff, more and more people entering into the wage commodity system, working in the formal economy for, for their wage to earn their living, fewer and fewer people engaging in subsistence work, subsistence farming, and other kinds of things. And that seems like one way to answer the question. But I want to change the terms very slightly. Uh, the slight change in terms is actually the pivotal move. It's in some sense, here's the value added that I, that I give to these theoretical apparatuses I'm, I'm borrowing on. These three Aurigian periods can also be described as uh, periods in which first circulation dominates over production, or right? that's the mercantile phase when what you're getting is circulation of commodities, but it's not production heavy. Then you have a period where production dominates. That's, this is this MC period here. That's, that's, that MC means industrial production, money to, cap, money to uh, commodity, right? To end, end, endless pouring of all money into the two commodities of labor power and means of production. So this is a period of production. And then the finance period is again a period of circulation uh, in which capital is circulating around a lot, but it's not a, a productive phase. And so I redivide Origi's three periods to the period circulation, production, circulation. Uh, and then I make a further move, which is to look at the entire breadth of this, of this span, sort of the length of capitalism from its takeoff in the early British Empire to the present as being, as more or less having that shape of being circulation dominated in its earliest years up until Again, the Industrial Revolution starts to generalize and bring more and more people into the wage system. And production largely dominating then, since as British production fails, U.S. production takes off. But now we have a period dominated by circulation, by U.S. finance capital really dominating the globe. And so we're back to a moment of circulation. And it turns out this maps perfectly onto the historical structure of riot strike riot that we have, the periodizing of this, right? Riots up until whatever, you know, till, till, till industrial revolution begins, uh, strikes and dominating until the collapse of US industrial production in 1973, and then the return of the riot. So that shape, riot, strike, riot, prime, is really the shape, circulation, production, circulation, prime. That's the shape we're looking at. So now I'm gonna switch slides, switch, switch moods a bit. Uh, and go through, oh dear, these are in a completely bizarre order. I think we want to start with slide number five, see what happens. Oh, so this is all E.P. Thompson. We've looked at this already. So this is, we're now here looking at the, here's, here's the, the price setting claim, but we've already covered that more or less. Let's see if I can find slide six. Uh, we've already looked at that stuff. We can go to eight. So here's Thompson narrating the, this first transition in mean, quite uh, beautiful uh, melancholy tones for Thompson. We're coming to the end of one tradition and a new tradition has scarcely emerged. So we have the shift from the, toward the 
pressure on wages is becoming more vigorous. Uh, we start to get these various kinds of, of organizations. And the really interesting struggles we get in this period, for me, the most interesting struggles of this transitional period from riot to strike or circulation to production are the quite famous Luddite and Captain Swing uh, uh, struggles in England, which I assume most people are familiar with. Although, of course, the Luddites are, are the, that term has become so common that it's become so commonly misunderstood, right? People now often use Luddite to mean uh, someone who's technophobic, right, and doesn't doesn't want to get with the modern world and and technological uh, possibilities. But that wasn't the struggle of the Luddites at all. They they didn't seem to worry much about technology as such. The Luddites were concerned about job loss, right? Um, and uh, this gets us back to that logic of surplus population that I talked about before, which is to say increasing automation of the economy is the same as uh, the generation of surplus population. And this is exactly the concern of the Luddites and, and of the Captain Swing riots in England in exactly this transitional period. This is all happening 1814, 1816, 1818, 1820, uh, exactly in the transitional moment. You get these Luddites and Captain Swing uh, groups running around and smashing spinning jennies, smashing various kinds of new weaving equipment that they recognize are gonna are gonna displace labor uh, from uh, the the wage, and so they see rising production, they see the displacement of labor, and you start to get this struggle against it. So we now want to ask the really interesting, difficult question: Are the luddites or the captain swing actions are those riots or strikes? Now they are all identified as riots. In fact, people didn't really have the language for strikes at this at this time. Here's a great passage from from Charles Tilly in in France, which is quite fascinating about how people identify things, right? So it's an account of a riot um, in 1832, right? Uh, according to my deputy's report, does not appear to have any political overtones already, as Sigrid has noted long ago. That's a quite uh, curious claim: a riot without any political overtones. And you know, so writes a prosecutor two weeks after the July Revolution. It's a riot of textile workers who want to raise and pay, and by their own accounting, broke the windows of the main shops where they went in force to ask for written agreements about the raises. So not only is this almost certainly political, how can we imagine people demanding pay, a uh, higher pay to be non-political? But it's probably not a riot, right? The language of riot dominates and the language of the strike barely exists. Uh, but by the Thompson distinction, it's pretty much of a strike, right? They go in and they demand a raise in pay. Uh, so it's a, it's a struggle over pay. They do the things like breaking windows. We had the phrase smashy before when people were asking what defines a riot. Smashy is the term of art for uh, when people go out breaking windows, right? So, we, so this is a moment of smashy, but it's not smashy for the purpose of, of, of how we understand what riots were for in the 17th or 18th century. It's smashy for the purpose that we'll understand strikes to be for, which is demanding uh, pay raises. So some, there's some characteristics of a riot, right? It's not workplace. There's no downing of tools. But there's also real characteristics of strike. There's the workers appearing as workers. There's the demands about pay. So this is a classic transitional moment but it's totally unidentifiable. Right? This is utterly opaque to the people of the time. They, they don't know what strikes are in some sense and can't identify them. The riot is the only model they have. So this is this moment of transition in which we have a shift from struggles in the marketplace, right? which is the space of circulation by definition. Exchange is part of the sphere of circulation to the sphere of production, the industrial workplace. So this is, again, this is the exact sort of, if one wants to now, uh, transcode the terms of marketplace and workplace, riot and strike, it's really circulation and production. Market is a circulation space, workplace is a production space. So we have a shift in struggle from circulation to production in exactly this period. Uh, let me see if I can pull up a couple other slides. So, uh, yeah, this is just a series of images of production, uh, sorry, images of circulation. Here's, here's one of my favorite images of circulation, uh, a rather tragic cargo ship un undergoing great uh, difficulties. But so you see, as you can see, I've sort of made the leap 
from that moment in 18, you know, 1814 in England, 1830 in France, when we have a shift from circulation to production, uh, which, which then happens across the, the world of capital. We have a shift back uh, uh, in, the, in our era, post-1973, from production to circulation. So this is a model of circulation. If you think about the two great financial facts at a global level, post-1973, we have the rise of finance capital and we have the build out of shipping, of which this is an image of. What I want to note is these two huge transformations, the build out of shipping, the, you know, the Toyotaization uh, in which shipping and circulation become far more important, all our processes, capital leaps, leaps into circulation to struggle for profit by trying to decrease its costs, containerization, as we have this image here, the great transformation, the container ship. But finance is the same phenomenon. Finance is also a circulatory fact, right? Finance is not itself productive, but it helps us circulate things faster and faster. So if I have a sweater factory, you know, let's say I've made 100 sweaters. Hypothetically, uh, I, I then have to like sell them and sit around waiting and the, and, then, and the process slows down to make my money back from the sweaters uh, before I can go back to the production process. But if I can borrow money from finance, I can speed up my process, right? I can, I can send those ships out. Um, I can do all my reinvesting. Finance smooths over the, the entire circulation process so there's no pauses waiting for anything to happen. So finance itself, and I want to really insist on this because I can't uh, prove it, so I'm sort of argue by insistence. I can't prove it because I don't have time, basically. Finance is a technology of circulation, just as shipping is a technology of circulation. And you get this huge shift post-73 into the space of circulation. Uh, let's see if I have some more. I probably have a couple more images. Where's image 12? Maybe no image 12. Image 12, maybe a mirage. So some things to note about this shift from production to circulation that happens post-73. One, it doesn't mean strikes come to an end. Uh, as, as David pointed out earlier, riots continue during the strike phase, strikes continue during the riot phase. Uh, so strikes don't come to an end, but notably, strikes themselves move into the space of circulation. So Walmart is one of the, actually the biggest labor strikes we've had in the US in the last few years, and Walmart is also a space of circulation. Right? Walmart is a marketplace. They don't produce anything. They sell things that are produced globally, all over the place, like Haiti, South Korea, China, Indonesia, many, many places where production has moved to, and Walmart helps circulate them. So that's so you get strikes that move into into the space of circulation and other non-productive spaces. The Chicago Teachers Association strike, right, was another substantial strike we had. Again, not in the space of production. The UPS workers strike was the other largest strike we've had in the U.S. Again, circulation strike, not production strike. Right? This has been a decisive fact that even as strikes continue to obtain, um, they happen more and more in the space of circulation, and they have to be more and more be uh, repressed. There's the riot police, ironic name, right? That outfit riot cops, but they're moving in to break up a strike. Uh, um, the very same Walmart strike we're looking at in the upper left, there's the cops moving in to break it up in the, in the lower right. So strikes themselves do persist, but they too exist in the space of circulation. Let me see if I can go to my next image. Yeah, this is an image beloved to me. It won't be recognizable to all of you. But during the sequence, as Badi would say, of the Occupy movement in the United States, certainly the largest uh, organized action that happened in, that, in, uh, in all the Occupy movements was the uh, Oakland port shutdown that Occupy Oakland engaged in where 25,000 people marched on the port of Oakland and blockaded it and shut it down, alas, for only a day. Uh, this is a, an image from the, the evening of that night of people sort of standing up on containers, sh on, on shipping containers and, and waving flags. And we see again, sort of that pure logic, right, of, of uh, struggles in the space of circulation. And that's essentially my claim. I think we've come to the end of my story, right, which is to say, to understand,